welcome to First Congregational Church in St. Albans, Vermont. We are a welcoming group of seekers, believers, and doubters. And please know that no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here to travel with us. This morning is Communion Sunday. So please take a moment and be sure you have a little something to drink and a little something to eat with you. It could be coffee and a donut. It could be juice and bread. It's up to you. We have, uh, as a reminder, we have suspended in-person worship for the time being. You can catch us on cable station 1079 or on YouTube or on our website. Today in the United Church of Christ is Amistad Sunday. It celebrates the founding of the American Missionary Association, which was born from the abolitionists who won the Supreme Court victory in 1841, which freed the, slave, the Africans who fought for their freedom on the slave ship, the Amistad. This interracial agency worked in education, discipleship, and justice. It eventually became part of the national mission structure of the United Church of Christ. It undergirds our work in mission. Please join me for this morning's opening prayer. Thankful are we for all the blessings of this life. Love, freedom, bounty, and beauty. The joy we know is beyond our words to speak. We can only imagine the suffering and pain of human slaves, past and present, yearning from the depths of their souls to know the freedom we enjoy. We celebrate this day that heritage we have in the cause of human freedom. We celebrate this day our spiritual ancestors who worked for the freedom of the many people on the slave ship Amistad. That ship, like the cross, remind us of the ever-present possibility of human evil. And may that ship, like the cross, remind us of the power of divine love. May we, through divine love, shed the false, unneighborly, covetous, and dishonorable desires of the lives we sometimes live. And keep the commandments and walk in the way that brings life. Amen. Our opening hymn, Let Us With a Joyful Mind. It's in the New Century Hymnal, number 16, and it's also your insert. Verses 1, 3, and 5.
We focus on whatever we do that oppresses and enslaves others who, like us, are created in the image of the divine. And now we seek the grace that frees us to live life in faithfulness to holy love. Amen. Mistakes, misgivings, are all part of life. We all make mistakes. We all don't live the holy life we want to live, the holy life we want to show others. But know that that doesn't separate us from God's love, because God loves us without condition today and every day. Amen. Transport Africans 
into slavery to Cuba, to the US. And in 1839, there are 55 Africans who captured and took control over this ship, the Amistad. They then tried to take the ship back to Africa, but they lost their way and they ended up on Long Island in New York, where US officials boarded the ship and arrested all of the people on it, all the Africans, and put them into jail in Connecticut. While they were in jail, they were befriended by Christian abolitionists. And abolitionists were people who worked to abolish, to stop slavery. Our church, First Congregational, here in St. Albans, had members who were, who were abolitionists and people who used to work for the Underground Railroad, which would help people escape slavery and live into freedom. So these Christian abolitionists hired lawyers, and it included former President John Quincy Adams, which you may have learned about in your history class. And they appealed this case all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 1841, the 55 Africans were declared free. Let's have a prayer. Holy Creator, our history is not pretty. We as human beings have done awful things to each other. May we, be, may we be reminded of that. Let us not forget our history. Let us live into a better world. Let us live into something we can be proud of and happy in. In your holy name we pray. Amen. This morning's scripture, the Hebrew scripture reading, is from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. Then God spoke these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything else, anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Today's gospel reading is from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The Passover, the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews asked him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years. You will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples
disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So ends this morning's readings. May God add a blessing of understanding to these words. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O oh God, my strength and my redeemer. For those of you who know me, you probably have an inkling that this is one of my favorite scenes with Jesus. The rebel in me really responds to this. He's riled up and he's not going to take it anymore. One of my friends from seminary posted a meme a few years ago, and I, I shared it with the Bible study this week. It reads, if anyone ever asks you, what would Jesus do? Remind them that flipping over tables and chasing people with a whip is within the realm of possibilities. <laughs> As a former Sunday school teacher, I, I really appreciate the juxtaposition of WWJD, what would Jesus do? As many of you know, WWJD is a frequently used Sunday school trope. What it means is before you act, think about what Jesus would do in this situation. Of course, we typically think, turn the other cheek. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. And come to me, little children. It points to our Sunday school image of Jesus, kindly, loving, soft, comfortably domesticated. In the scene where Jesus cleanses the temple, he seems unpredictable, forceful, and wild. In fact, in John's Gospel, we find that Jesus frequently doesn't mince his words. He can be abrupt and brusque. And in this passage, I sense urgency. Here, Jesus is making a really big statement, and no one can ignore it. He has no time for anything less. This is also a scene that appears in all the Gospels. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke Gospels, the cleansing of the temple occurs just before the Passion. That is, before Jesus' arrest and ultimate execution. In John's Gospel, John places this scene at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And the temple cleansing sets the tone, he jumps in at the deep end, and he takes charge. He openly challenges the establishment and the authorities. What a way to begin! But it's not Jesus' very first act in John, but it's his first really public act. In the story just before the cleansing, Jesus performs his first miracle in the Gospel of John. He's at a wedding in Cana, and he turns water into wine. Jesus then travels to Jerusalem for the Passover. He is one of many people who will be making this pilgrimage. We learn later in John that Jews would go to Jerusalem ahead of the Passover to purify themselves, to prepare for the holy day. From John chapter 11, 55, Now the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. And they would go to the temple to do this. They purchased animals for ritual sacrifice, they pay their temple tax. That's what the money changers were there for. The temple was a bustling place. But really, the people were just trying to prepare for Passover, trying to get into right relation with God. It's not dissimilar to how Christians prepare for Easter. We have Lent. It's a 40-day journey of meditation, prayer, and reflection all to put us in right relation with God and help us prepare for Easter. However, what Jesus found in the temple was not scripture.
spiritual preparation. What he saw was a marketplace. He had found that the focus of the people in the temple had to do more with money and power. They had made idols. And he doesn't mince his words. Jesus says, his father's place has been made a marketplace. It's such a human thing to do. We do it all the time. Think about Christmas and how that's been co-opted by commercial consumerism. Or in a similar way, think about the selling of papal indulgences that we all learned about during the Middle Ages when people would pay money to be granted forgiveness for sins. They could even bank it up, paying the right people to pull strings for you. So Jesus makes a whip out of cords and chases the animals out. The people selling them follow. He pours coins onto the floor. Chaos ensues. It's a very different scene from turning water into wine at a private wedding, surrounded by your family and friends. After the wedding, there is still a chance for Jesus to disappear, for the rumors to die down. But after the temple cleansing, there was no chance for Jesus to fade from the scene. He could not opt for a more public venue to enter his public ministry. The temple in Jerusalem was the center of Jewish spiritual and political life around the time of Passover was the busiest time of all in Jerusalem. There were people from all over the empire who had come to Jerusalem for Passover. So Jesus was really making a statement, and there was no turning back. Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. By father's house, we know that Jesus was referring to the temple, God's house. Mary Hinkle Shore writes that the temple was the meeting place between the God of Israel and God's people. The meeting place between God and the people. Where do we meet God today? Where is that meeting place? Is it the church? A special place set aside for worship? Is it nature, surrounded by all of creation, our poor, abused Eden? Is it within the relationships we have with people, our community? Jesus, after all, said, wherever two or three are gathered, there am I. And are we made in God's image? Isn't God in our Christian context triune, creator, Christ, Holy Ghost? So of course we meet God in all those places, in churches, in nature, with each other, and many, 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 many other places, because God is infinite, and we can't put limits on him or her. And just as Jesus found the temple turned into a marketplace, we too find many of the ways we meet God corrupted by power and money. Traditionally, holy days are places where we meet God. Christmas is now a mockery of itself. It's been turned into such a marketplace that it's really split off from traditional Christianity. Christians are desperately trying to put Christ back into Christmas, but still we buy things regardless of our awareness. And certainly it seems as though the church has been selling salvation well, forever, from papal indulgences mentioned earlier to magical trinkets of all sorts, from religious, spiritual, new age, to money-grubbing TV evangelists selling hope and healing. Our church has an unpleasant history of being wedded to empire, Rome, England, America. Where there is power and money and oppression, there follows the need for religious validation. Let's not forget manifest destiny. I can't imagine what Jesus would do if faced with an empire who sold people, obliterated creation, and used the church 
founded in his name to validate its actions. So yes, it seems wherever we meet God, there is a marketplace. And it's not just the church. We have commodified the natural world. Not simply the resources themselves, where we take whatever we can put a monetary value on and destroy everything in its path. Think about tar sands and the leveling of the ancient royal forest and the poisoning of the land. Think about pipelines running through indigenous sacred ground. But we commodify something else, too, because we do value the natural world. We commodify our experiences in the natural world. Meaning God and nature is reserved for people who have access to it. People who can afford transportation, lodging, time off work. There is certainly an industry that surrounds that. Being poor or living in an inner city really limits your access. And yes, we, we turn God's places into marketplaces. And it's not just the church and nature. We have an unfortunate history of commodifying people. Those who are made in God's image, just like us. Without people, we have no community, no relationship. Today is Amistad Sunday, and we learned a little bit about Amistad and our time with children. Slavery, what an insult to God. And although we've outlawed slavery in this country, we still commodify people. There are wage slaves, the working poor. What about private prisons? That's an interesting way to make money off of our human brothers and sisters. And so the marketplace grows beyond the church, beyond nature, or even people. The marketplace seems to have an insatiable appetite. And it's a bit bleak. But just as Jesus drove out the sellers and the money changers, we too can fashion a whip of cords and take possession of that which should not be sold. I read something this past week that referred to Jesus as a kind of performance artist, that this was a bit of early guerrilla theater. And that made me think of my favorite performance artist, the Reverend Billy of the Church of Stop Shopping and the Stop Shopping Choir. They're out of New York City. They've been around for years. And early in his ministry, People didn't know what to make of Rev Billy. Was he a Rev or was he not? But well, he's not as such. He's really, and they are performance artists, and their stage is wherever they can be heard by the most people. Reverend Billy wears a bright white suit with a dog collar, that's like a priest collar, and has this giant blonde pompadour hairdo a very TV evangelist from like the 60s. Early on, their focus was exclusively on consumerism, trying to get people to stop shopping. Their approach, humorous, fun, brilliant costumes, gospel style singing. There's a film from about 15 years ago called What Would Jesus Buy? And there's a great scene where Reverend Billy is with this old fashioned megaphone and he's at the front of a crushing Black Friday crowd, yelling to the people, repent, turn back, it's not too late. There are all sorts of ways that we can participate in stopping this marketplace, and that we can prevent and help stop the creator's house from being a marketplace. The long struggle over the Dakota Access Pipeline at the Standing Lock Reservation is one such way. The pipeline threatens sacred tribal land, wildlife, religious and cultural practices, and water. The thing we all need, the water protectors. Theirs is a traditional, nonviolent, direct action protest. Legal battles, moral battles. It continues. 
We've lost sight of it in the past five years, but it continues. And from nonviolent direct action to rebellion, more ways to stop the marketplace. The Africans on the slave ship Amistad rebelled, trying to save themselves from this horrific marketplace. Caught, jailed, and in a rare case of justice, freed after a legal battle that reached the U.S. Supreme Court. Jesus is so intense in this passage, and he doesn't fit with the soft, domesticated Jesus we like to sing about. But we as humans are prone to corruption. We are too easily infatuated, infatuated with money and with power. We bow to power. We perpetuate it. I think about the people in the temple paying their temple tax. They were doing what they were told, and they believed it was the right thing to do for God. Just like many of us, they were going along to get along, trying to ensure a good outcome. So Jesus, he must have shocked people. He woke the people up who were in the temple, not just those in power drawing attention to himself, not just those who were selling things, but he woke up regular, everyday people. He wakes us up, and he wakes us up to the corruption and our role in it. So now that we're awake, I guess it's our job to stay that way. It is 
right to give our God thanks and praise. We remember on the night of betrayal and destruction, on the eve of his death, Jesus gathered his disciples for the Passover feast. Jesus took the bread, and after giving thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, and after giving thanks, he said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. I invite you now to take a bit of your bread and your wine or your coffee and share communion.
May we be reminded that you are always near, O oh God of peace. Thank you. 